right, let's move into the panel discussion now. And again, remember, this is also for you to be a part of. This is for you to uh, send your questions, to engage, to send anything that you'd like to through on the chat line. We'd really like to hear from you today. So, healthcare reimagined, where are we going? So, the right to have access to healthcare services is a basic human right, by, which is guaranteed by the Constitution. I mean, we, we tend to forget that sometimes. Section 27 of the Constitution provides that everyone has the right to have access to healthcare, with both the Constitution and the National Health Act envisaging a single health system for South Africa. We've spoken at length about that today, the NHI, the problems with it, and the benefits of it as well. Now, in our final panel discussion for the day, we look at what we can all do to enable greater healthcare for all. What is the role of the corporate citizenry in taking healthcare to the people, and what opportunities, what partnerships and innovations can we utilize in the healthcare ecosystem? So, of course, our panel now, you know, you've just heard from uh, Dr. Suleiman and uh, looking forward to engaging him more as well. Um, and then joining us on this panel, we've got the CEO of Cura Medical, that's uh, Vuyani, Dr. Vuyani Mflomi. Now, Dr. Mflomi studied um, medicine at the University of Cape Town, where he completed his degree with a distinction in preclinical, clinical, and final clinical examinations. In 2014, he was awarded the Rhodes Scholarship, and at the age of 29, he completed his PhD at the University of Oxford. That's amazing. In 2018, he built a team that would launch an innovative digital healthcare company, pioneering premium hospital at home services. That's Cura Medical. So let's welcome him today, Dr. Vuyani Mflomis. Such a nice pleasure to have you, and welcome. Thank you very much for having me. It's an absolute pleasure. It really, really is, and I think your voice is just going to to really um, boost this a lot. And of course, um, I'm joining us, uh, Bandika, which we 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 know from uh, from the beginning, who welcomed us all here today from Afrocentric, the CEO of Afrocentric. So, I mean, we, we're going to do a bit of a summary in a short while in terms of mm. of what we've heard today and the powerful message that you've just given us today as well, uh, Dr. Suleiman. But I want to bring Dr. Mplomi into this. You know, we talk about there was one comment that stood out for me for Dr. Suleiman who said that some people think of going to hospital and it's like, I'm not going in there. It's like, don't let me go in there. I am, I, I, but not everybody can afford home care, which is what you come in. But I mean, perhaps talk to us from your perspective in, in, in reimagining healthcare in South Africa and where we're at. Let's get your views on it. Uh, so firstly, thank you so much for the invitation and, and um, it, it's really a, a great pleasure to, to be here and Dr. Suleiman, what an honor it is to, 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 to get to sit next to you and listen to you uh, share some, some of these uh, wonderful insights. Um, I, think that, uh, I think from the, the talk that we just received, um, I think it was a, a great demonstration that it will take a whole lot more than just sort of traditional models of healthcare to deliver or to enable healthcare delivery for everyone. Right. Um, I think the, the most unfortunate part about our healthcare system is it is hospice-centric in nature. It is, uh, it, it is centered around hospitals. Um, when patients are unwell, the first thing that they talk about is, I need to go to a hospital as opposed to I need to access healthcare. And so, however, there are great limitations, uh, infrastructure limitations, resourcing limitations, having the, the we, we, there are limitations around um, human resources and being able to see every single patient. And so, um, wha wha one of the ways in which we, 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 we re-envision and re-imagine healthcare is looking at, I guess, innovative ways in which we can utilize those resources. Um, whether it's converting, you know, general practitioners and enabling them to see more than the patients that they can see at the moment, whether it's shifting the, I guess, traditional places of care from being hospitals and bringing those to um, the patient's home and creating an environment in which we could provide hospital-level care. And the amazing work um, that Ahmed and his colleagues have done in being able to reconfigure existing funding sort of infrastructure, the reimbursement environment to enable those kind of models. And of course, working with different providers within and other stakeholders within the healthcare system to enable this has really allowed us to one, you know, not only decompress those busy healthcare facilities, but to also reach um, patients, some of whom were, were in, uh, you know, on the last mile of health. How has the uptake of home care been? Is, is it something that you're finding that people are actually opting for if they can afford it? Because I can't imagine it comes cheap. 
Well, relative to um, what the, I guess, traditional hospital costs, it is a fraction of the cost, right? Uh, a massive proportion of, of, of the sort of healthcare spend is um, it goes towards brick and mortar facilities rather than so servicing the overhead rather than going towards the things that actually make the patients better. A fraction of the cost goes towards the provider, a fraction of the cost goes towards pathology and radiology and medicine, right? And so what we then did was to, to really start thinking about how do we start sort of shifting the patient away from where there's the greatest healthcare spend and bring and, and only focus on the essential elements of in hospital care, delivering that to the patients um, at home. What that then does is that it drives down, you know, healthcare spend quite significantly. Um, you know, studies and many studies were published before we even embarked on this mission that demonstrate that demonstrated that by simply shifting patients from traditional hospitals into the home reduces healthcare costs by 52%. So what that does is that many people who would ordinarily not be able to access healthcare can now access those healthcare services. And so what we then do is then take all of those, whether it's radiology or nursing care or medication or IV drips or close monitoring, we then bring that in an environment that is most suitable um, for patients. And so while so while we do have, for example, a very, very high unemployment rate, in many, in many ways, the cost of delivery of healthcare in the patient's home can sometimes be even cheaper than the provision of healthcare in public healthcare facilities. But it's very, very difficult for people to start thinking outside of that um, because of how we, our propensity to think of healthcare around hospitals. So if you look at around what's happening around the globe at the moment, a lot of healthcare is shifting more and more um, outside of, 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 of sort of healthcare facilities facilities. Um, a recent study by McKinsey showed that about 265 billion US dollars worth of healthcare services are shifting towards the home. If you look at what's happening in the NHS, more and more care is moving away from traditional brick and mortar facilities and going to the home. And we are trying to find ways in which we can pioneer that. And for us, the greatest beneficiary of that particular healthcare delivery model is the public sector patients. We are demonstrating this model within the private sector, but we are racing towards the provision of these services to our people. Yeah, amazing. Uh, it's a brilliant idea, it really, really is. But um, let, let's, let's talk a little bit further about this. So, uh, Ahmed, I mean, you, you're hearing two sides of the coin here. So we're hearing from Dr. Mklomi the, the access to care and something that we could actually be doing at our home and, and, and taking it to the people as opposed to the people coming to healthcare. Um, and then we're hearing uh, things from Dr. Suleiman who it just, it, just, it, it, it just amazes me all the time, the kind of stories that come out of it and the things that are happening there on the ground. Access to healthcare and good healthcare, I mentioned it in the introduction, it is part of our constitution, it's a basic human right and we're failing millions of South Africans on this, on this, um, on this constitutional right. Talk to me about this. I mean, how, how do we better this? Sure, Leanne, so that's a loaded question, yeah. right? Um, and I think, you know, if we, want, if we look at the things that Dr. Imtiaz has referred to as well, what COVID has exposed, we're better off knowing than not knowing. We're better off dealing with the issues and the challenges as opposed to sweeping them under the rug. Uh, and similarly, as we know, a lot of, there's a lot of good initiatives that actually got uh, fast-tracked during the pandemic. So aspects like virtual consultations, suddenly you know, people rolled it out within months that we could build the capabilities and actually implement that. So when we talk about home-based care, which is more than step-down or subacute facilities, it also goes into the primary care level as well. So, and, and what we refer to there is that for that kid that Dr. Imtia has referred to earlier on, um, who grows up and it's a child of a poor parent, for example, that might not get the access to care, virtual consultations can play a big role in terms of expanding the services and getting better care more accessible to everybody. Now, obviously, it's a multifaceted aspect. You, one needs data, one needs access to a mobile device, etc. We need to look at all of this. There is no silver bullet. That's the reality of it. But we also need a multifaceted approach to it. We need to move away from the bureaucracy aspects that Dr. Imtiaz has referred to as well and just get on with the job at hand. Um, we've got a working model. In many respects, we've got a world-class working model in the private sector. And, and that's the greatest travesty that we sit with is how, and we should feel bad about it, that we sit with 8 million people sitting with world-class care and there's a further 50 million people 
that have little access. It's there, we do have universal health coverage to an extent that if they rock up at a private, at a public sector facility, they could get care, but they'll join the queue, they will wait, they might not have access to the medicines, etc. And this is not, and we heard it from the minister earlier on, by the way, as well, which is quite profound. The minister did not say that they will sort the problem out. The minister has invited all of us to participate in helping to find the solution. That's really what this today was all about in many respects as well. Yeah, and, th and that's an important point to note because we keep saying it, government can't do it alone. And we understand that, and I do understand that. However, when you hear stories from, uh, from Dr. Suleiman and you, you, you're talking to the bureaucracy and the fact that, you know, well, if you don't want to do that, then come take the mask off the individual. If that's, if that's the point that you want to make, you come do it. I'm going to save lives and you can worry about signing papers, red tape and documentation. I need to save a life right now. What's the holdup? I mean, what, what do they say is the problem? Where does this bureaucracy, where, where's the problem? I don't know. The problem is in the understanding. A lot of them sit in the offices. They don't go on the road. They don't know what's going on outside on the road. You know? And quite often you find that the MECs or the Premier are get feedback from people down and everything is fine. There's no problem. Yeah. And suddenly when you start showing this to the, the, the problems, they think that you're trying to undermine them. Until they check for the credit, they see themselves what's going on and realize no, there is a, is a problem. So there are healthcare workers and there's also, there's another, uh, there's another element to this, you see? To give a government anything free is a problem. I'm being blunt about it. Because you, can, you can't get a cut from trying this for free. But there are people who get machines or buy stuff and they get a cut for the machines. So the more expensive it is, the more money you get. So you get things for free, it doesn't benefit anybody. So you can't accept that. You will find that it's part of when they will tell you openly, okay, put this machine, inflate the price. I will give you, you know, something for it. And that brings another point. Corporates always talk about government being corrupted. But you ask the question, who corrupts government? Yeah. Corporates do that. You know, and, and, and we need to fix the system all over. And there's four values or four systems or four explanations, characteristics, spirituality, morality, ethics, and values. This country needs it across the board. We fix that, we won't even have a money problem. Because what we have won't get stolen, won't be abused, won't be mismanaged. People have start having a conscience to use what we have in a good way. The government puts a lot of money into healthcare, let's be honest, and a lot of the times it's not their fault. You would find that people will suddenly get, uh, 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 some company will speak to them, look, I'm delivering, I'll give you, I'll give, take sign for a million dollars worth of medication, we'll deliver 300,000. You sign it off that you received a million dollars worth of medication, you only receive 300,000. So already there's 700,000 in profit, and some of the medication I know is stolen and stolen in the private sector. What happens? The government gets blamed, you don't give enough supplies, you're shortchanging the hospital, you're not taking care of us, and the blame falls on the people itself in charge of health. But there's a problem with management. There's a problem with systems going wrong. And you can see the hospitals and you go, quite often the management is just falling apart. And we need to change that. Yes, there are moves to try to fix that, but these are all parts of the problem. That's why I say it's a system. It's not somebody deliberately trying to mess something up. Yes, you get the crooks in the system, it's true. They're there everywhere. But there are a lot of good people who want to do the right things, but they just don't know how to do the right things. They don't have the skill to do that. Yeah, and, th and that's the problem. I mean, you'll take something like um, Charlotte Matpeke. Okay, so we see the fire that was caused there, but that is, uh, which we, we understand, I mean, after, you know, reports and the delays, and I mean, the, 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 we, in the middle of a pandemic, one of our biggest hospitals burns down. I mean, this doesn't make any sense. And why? Because everybody that's working inside that building has said it's falling apart there's no upkeep, that these, these establishments are not looked after, and they keep speaking and nobody listens, and they keep saying, guys, th this is not right, it shouldn't look like this, this is a dangerous, this is going to be a problem, this is going to be a problem, and then it burns down. And then patients have got nowhere to go. And then again, we lose more lives, probably these lives, and then we're talking about oncology units, I mean, we're talking about lives that could have been saved. I mean, what, let's take that as an example. What happened at that hospital? And now we're hearing budgets of, what? A, a, I don't, I'm scared, was it a billion rand or something to fix it? I don't even know what they put aside there to fix this hospital, but, and it's still nowhere near. To be fair, again, well, not to, to make a point, you see, if there was no fire in Charlotte, life would have carried on as normal. Suddenly, some clever person came and says, it's not structurally sound, or it does not fit, you know, it is, it is, it is, it's not compliant. The word used is not compliant. And, you know, the fire is not compliant. I like to know 
every other hospital in South Africa. Is it fire compliant and structurally compliant? Is the certain of job of municipality buildings compliant? And is parliament compliant? If they are not compliant, shut the whole country down. Either you do that, or we say, well, what's the better thing to do? Then they want to know, what disaster evacuation plan do you have for the fire in Charlotte? Man, the guy showed you they did it, they moved the patients in 12 hours. What plan you want? You saw the action. The medical staff moved the patients in 12 hours and nobody died. What disaster plan you want? Did you not see what happened? And you want a write-up. You're too busy filling papers and forms. You don't know what else going on on the ground. You know? And one guy can sign one form and shut the whole hospital down that's supposed to be the main hospital that can hold 400 critical ill patients during COVID-19 and the wave of the, the, in, the third, uh, in the third wave, it shut down in June because somebody wants some compliance certificate. We lost more people from the compliance certificate than actually from the fire of the hospital. You know? And that's the kind of thing, again, it's a problem with the system. And this, the president has got to sit with his cabinet and say, look, this cannot happen in the country. The clerk at the bottom can't tell us what to do. What is an interest of disaster management? Why do you have declared a disaster, a national disaster? National disaster means we waive all the rules and we throw them out of the window. We do what's necessary. Otherwise, what's the point of having a national disaster announcement? The dis announcement says, open the hospital and fix it. Yes, we have to fix the structure. We have to fix the fire. But in the meantime, don't shut it down in the height of a pandemic. Let's make it functional. And let's do that for all the hospitals in the country and everything else. And we take precautions and say, OK, in the next two months, we'll fix wing A. But we don't shut wing B, C, D, and E while we're fixing wing, wing A. We run, let it run. You put burden on 17 other hospitals in the city. Now the same doctors and healthcare workers got all this extra burden of patients coming there. The patients have to travel a longer distance to get there. So what's going to happen? They're not going to come for treatment. They're just going to ignore it. They're going to get more depressed. They're going to get more complicated. And the budget on the health service is going to get worse. The doctors are going to get demotivated. And you're going to find they're going to resign. And how many resigned from Charlotte McKeke already? And we don't have the spare capacity of trained people to fill those posts. You can't train them in one week. This thing takes three to five to seven years. Where are you going to get them from? The whole system goes backwards. Government has to seriously sit together as a cabinet. That's their job. Because the government needs to understand this country doesn't belong to them. They're only the custodians of the country. The country belongs to 60 million people. And it is their job to make sure it functions properly for 60 million people. If it means calling an emergency cabinet meeting, like you had the National Command Council, to sit and do things, sit down and say, we've got a major problem in the health system. We need to fix it. What do we do to fix it? Yes, hospitals was run, but step by step, six months we'll fix this, 12 months we'll fix that bring in staff, infrastructure, or all the things I spoke about. And that's what we need to do. If we're really serious about fixing health in the country, and then invite the private sector. Please come. We can do from, for six months. We've got half the budget. Can you help us with the other half? Can you help us till we get the taxes right in the next two to three years? So, Dr. Mflomi, when you listen to this, I mean, obviously, we're in business to make money. Everybody. That's it. I mean, we had Stavros Nikolaou here earlier from Aspen. They've, I mean, yes, they've done an amazing amazing things and we know this but they've also made a lot of money and the private sector makes a lot of money and we we're making money off of people that are desperate for medical care so this brings me to my next question when you hear things going on in in the public sector as a as a private entity i mean would you step up to the plate would you want to help and how can the private sector get involved or is it just too frustrating leanne um I grew up in a township in Cape Town called Kailicha, raised by a, a single parent, massive family, um, same story as everybody else would tell you about, you know, ordinary South Africans. I went to medicine, I went to study medicine at UCT because I really wanted to make a difference. Uh, when I saw a video about the state in which Krisani Baragwanath was, I decided, I was in, I decided to go and do my internship there because I really wanted to lend a, a helping hand. But I distinctly remember when I was um, sitting in a hypertension clinic and a patient who, had this, who, who came in and had really, really scary high blood pressures. Um, and, and, and the reason for why she was in there and you know, she hadn't taken a medication was because not only was it not delivered to a clinic, but she didn't have food to take the medication and she was told that she needs to eat before she needs to do that. You can only take so much within the public health care system until you decide to go off and do something. Part of the reason why some of us decided to forego the conventional, um, you know, a sort of sort of clinical path, 
was because we wanted to do something about what is happening within the healthcare system. And really, the best place to deliver, uh, I guess, to deliver change, um, at least based on our experience, has been the private sector, right? You've got the necessary resources. Um, I have managed to attract a young, globally, you know, best-in-class, diverse team who have forgone forgo their own careers to come and do something about transforming healthcare in this particular country. And we're seeing that, and I think, you know, the COVID pandemic has demonstrated, you know, the private sector's ability to rally behind fixing healthcare problems um, within, the, within the country. To share one more anecdote, you know, part of what we do is that we leverage, uh, you know, remote um, health monitoring technology and, and bring in certain services to patients' homes. We reached out to three provincial governments of health to assist them in decompressing their busy healthcare facilities at the peak of the second wave. We were geared, we even went out and looked for additional funding to make sure that this service would be delivered to patients at a time when people were dying senselessly in hospitals. To try and get a single person to make a decision so it's not that there, was, there weren't any resources available to provide that. But part of what Dr. Suleiman was mentioning is that somebody needs to sign off on our ability to carry out those particular activities. And I think for us, that has been the greatest frustration. So the, 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 you know, the private sector is definitely a place in which you can bring about this change, and we are actively doing so right um, today. But I do think that as much as you know, we can make the case about you know, the private sector needing to come to the party, I think to Dr. Suleiman's remarks, I think government needs to come to the party to work with us, or at the very least, to unlock the various obstacles um, that are laid before us as we try and bring about the necessary change in the country. Yeah. You know, we heard the president in the State of the Nation address saying that he's going to have a special dedicated person to cut in the red tape and to try and make it a little bit more easier and more access and, and, and to allow things to move faster. So that is new. That's something that's going to hopefully change it and, and, and help. But, I mean, I suppose, I mean, the question also is here, um, does the private sector have an obligation to support government efforts? I mean, you, you can push and push and push some more, and then you just say, well, you know what, I, I, I'm giving up. It's easy to, for all of us to take that approach, but then you're giving up on South Africa. You're giving up on your own future, and you're giving up on the future of the other millions of South Africans and our kids' lives as well, Leanne. And, and that'll be a great travesty. While we beat ourselves up on all the problem statements that we have, and while the president has, ha, is putting this uh, team together, which is absolutely the right thing to do, it shouldn't, we shouldn't be sitting back and waiting either to say, well, we're going to get invited to something. Um, we need to take it upon ourselves to actually raise our hands and say, we, yeah, we want to do more. We can actually collaborate amongst ourselves to start doing a lot more together. And if one takes the work that was done over the last two years, right, B4SA, Solidarity Fund, etc., these are all great examples where people raise their hands without any expectation of reward or recognition or anything like that of just doing the right things. And those taxpayer base, a large proportion thereof, that is funding the fiscus, there are a lot of good people in South Africa that just wants to do right by the fellow South Africans, that's willing to actually give up of their time, their energy, their money, their resources that they may have to be able to support. And if we can cut through that level of bureaucracy and actually start collaborating, uh, and I mean, today was a classic uh, powerful example, in fact, during the breaks that we've had, of just the people that are here today that are sharing notes about the things that can be done to be able to get together after this and move forward. And, and that's, if we're sitting and waiting, we're not going to move anyway. If we can reach out and say, well, where's the next ball you need? Let us go drill that ball for you. Then a school is better off. And if a school is better off, a little community is better off. Because that ball does not belong to anybody. That water comes out of the earth. It never belongs to anybody. It's for everybody to use. And these are small examples of things that we can do. We don't have to boil the ocean. We don't have to solve all of the problems in one go. You can choose which problems we want to solve um, and actually move forward on it. And in fact, Dr. Suleiman's closing comments, when he summarized his five points, if you want to know where to focus on NHI, that's the five points. Don't go build up your massive budgets, etc. 
management, infrastructure, maintenance, those are the five points that you can start with and say, well, let me focus on that for the next three to five years. Let's use the budget exclusively for that and we start moving forward as a country. Yeah, yeah. I, and and um, uh, uh, Sume also saying the same kind of things. I mean, she was also so good at, 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 at saying that don't, don't bash it all down and start again. Use what you've got mm -hmm. and build up from there. And that was, that was also one of those wonderful, uh, Samu, Dr. Dubé was giving us a, that was such a lovely point to, to make because we need to do that. I mean, we really do. The infrastructure is there. We, we need to improve it. We need to take this pandemic and the lessons learned and, and move forward with it. I mean, that solidarity fund, if we can, if we can sit and talk about that for a little bit because when you were talking about the conversations we were having, you know, as, as people have gathered here and some people have been interacting with one another throughout the whole pandemic, but they've never actually met each other. And this was one of those instances where people have come together and you could hear them chatting and talking amongst one another. I mean, that solidarity fund was um, South African businesses, South African individuals, South Africans coming together, going into one fund. And the difference that that fund made to hospitals that I'm hearing, people were not coming right with government, so they went to the Solidarity Fund and said, we need ventilators now, and they did it. They gave the money, gave it to them, and put it all out. And I mean, that's just one story I was listening to. Uh, it can work. So when, when they come together, and corporates and business and individuals do actually work together with government, get rid of all the rubbish, it can work. Leanne, the president himself has said, we want the private sector involved with us. You got it from the number one. He was already saying, we want you to get involved. The Minister of Health is saying the same thing. So you got from decision makers, you already got an invitation to make it happen. The problem is in the system down the chain. You know, they need to fix the system down the chain. For example, when the pandemic started, we started supplying hospitals and start off in Gauteng because that's where it came first. You know, and we, the more we started supplying stuff, somebody calls you from the health department and says, you know, we've got to fill in this form and you've got to fill in this paper. I said, my friend, it's a pandemic. People are dying. You want it, yes or no? I'm filling in no form. And the guy said, okay, 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 don't worry. Just carry on distributing. <laughs> Send it to, to all the different hospitals. And people need to realize you can't be an obstacle within the system. In Eastern Cape, CEOs now are brave to speak. They phoned us. 32 individual CEOs called us. We got no food to feed the patients. They started crying. Now, that's a committed healthcare worker, a CEO of hospital, crying, we can't see the patients hungry. So we said, fine. We found the premier. We said, look, we inform you up front. We're not embarrassing the government. Be honest, there is a problem. The premier says, I agree with you. I'm sending the health MEC to you when you're giving out the food to, to those 32 hospitals. And the CEOs then took it as an opportunity to engage the health MEC. To her credit, this is an excellent health MEC. She said, look, we've got no budget. We don't have the means. Don't worry about government systems. Phone the, if you, if you want this stuff and give us the givers want to give it to you, call them directly. I don't have a problem. And she said, look, we don't have the money. We need your help. How can we do different things? In December, we got to call 40 hospitals. No food again. We didn't look at it as a problem, you know, that uh, why is people calling us? What I'm just saying is correct. If we turn our backs, we're turning our back on 60 million people or maybe 40 million people. And we can't do that. You know, we can't say the government's like this or somebody in the government's like that. The government is not like this, that, the other. It's people within the government that's a problem. Not everyone in government is a problem. There's a lot of people who want to do well, who want to do good, but government has to unlock its own systems. That's where the challenge is. Do not have six people to sign uh, you know, a form, and five of them are sick. Now it's on Zoom. Now they're not at work anymore because everybody's away from the office. To sign one form, for, we should take one minute, take six months. I can repeat, repeat, they don't understand urgency, emergency and disaster. And we need to fix that system up within the government system. Yeah. And when you do that, there is a lot of well-meaning people within the government sector who want to make this country work well. And we need to capitalize on that and the private sector to join hands to do that. And we can do it. And 40 million people are waiting for us to do that. It's amazing how when it makes a headline, it becomes a story. So we're hearing about this, about Baraguanath Hospital that didn't have food and the nurses and doctors pooling together. Meantime, it's happening everywhere. And this is the problem, is that, you know, these are, these are things that have almost just become a norm. And we can't let our people suffer like this. And that's, that's the reality. So let's, let's reimagine this. So let's, let's go. We, we know where the problems are. We know how to start fixing it. But how do we do that? So let's, let's try and bring it around in a circle. Ahmed, what do we do? So here we are. We know that the systems are slow. We know that 
we are missing leadership and there are too many corrupt individuals that are in the way. So we mean well and the, the, everything is there to say, okay, we're going to do this and this is how we're going to fix it. And then someone's there <laughs> stealing the money or not spending the money and doesn't know what they're doing because they don't have the right skills. And they're in the positions of like CEOs of hospitals and mayors and all of these things. And they actually don't know what they're doing. And then we all suffer as the people. So where? Uh, Stavros said we need, um, what was the word he used? Something about decisive leadership. We need somebody like Imtaz who doesn't give a damn and just goes ahead and does it. But it, it doesn't seem that that's what we got right now. There's too much fighting and power play here. So what do we do? What do we recommend we do? Uh, Leon, I think, it's a, I think it's a couple of things that we do. Firstly, I think is it's easy to criticize. It's easy to see all the problem statements. Yeah, for sure. uh, and that's just human nature, right? It's easy to see that. But there's also a lot of good that has been done historically. And, and we've got to learn from that and move forward. We, we need to move beyond the talk shows. We need to move beyond all of the forums that we want to have and actually get to on the ground implementation. So if we know that we have some burning challenges now, and uh, I think the speakers today generally have touched on a few things about the uh, adherence aspect of chronic diseases, um, post this, this pandemic, obviously, mental wellness, as has been touched on, primary care, etc. There's so many different aspects that we, we can start. And all it takes is one. We can choose one. Whether it's obesity, whether it's hypertension, choose one disease. And you can collab start bringing the right people together to actually start making a difference and make a meaningful impact. Work out implementation plans, which we can do, by the way, to collaborate between public and private. And Leanne, to your question about those individuals that block the system, well, let's work around them. If you work around them and just demonstrate to that element of confidence and trust that we're here for no other objective other than to do good. We hear the example of if private sector hospitals have capacity, we don't even need them to do it for free. There are corporates that are willing to put their hands up and say, well, I'm happy to sponsor. Uh, whether it's cataracts, whether it's uh, hip or knee replacements, etc., and utilize that capacity. And let's start taking people out of those queues that are sitting in public sector or shorten the length of time that they're waiting for that. So all we need to do is choose one. Choose one disease that we want to focus on and move forward on it. Choose one project that we want to do and move forward on that. Whether you choose to do it on boreholes, whether you choose to do it on education, and when we start moving in that way and agitating and pushing forward, by the way, the infrastructures have now been created. The last two years, we've got these infrastructure of B4SA, Solidarity Fund, etc. They should not end. Why should we let them end when there was a perfect mechanism of private sector contributing and where both private and public sector was calling on the need for money or solutions and they were getting it out of those funds? Let those continue, let those thrive, and we need to retain our resources. This is the biggest issue. If we are not going to be able to solve a health challenge if we do not have the resources in this country. And when we're scaring people away and looking at immigration, etc., then I'm even more concerned. But that can also be stopped. Hold them back here. It's really sad. I mean, I speak to, we all know, we've got stories of friends that are in public sector that don't get paid sometimes for two or three months because of bureaucracy in the system or somebody's working from home. It's, it's hard to imagine or believe that that will ever happen in private sector. And it should not happen. It's a travesty if somebody that's giving up their life to look after those that need it the most and, you, and they cannot even feed their own family then how do we move forward? So I hope that gives you some indication yeah. of how we move forward with these with this challenges. Lastly, I mean, uh, maybe an important point, Leanne, I can't solve it on my own, neither could Viani or Dr. Suleiman either. We need everybody to put their hand up that's willing to be part of this and to reach out and say, I want to join this, I want to join this cause, I want to be part of the solutioning of it. And we find these little nuggets to move forward as a country. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, you mentioned you, were, you brought up, you, you grew up in Kailicha, and it's going back to the area that you grew up in, your mom and your family and friends and everybody's still there. I mean, what are things like since you left, since you've gone, you've studied, you're doing what you're doing, but I mean, if you look to where you grew up and to how things are now, they're better or they're worse? Better. So they are getting better? Much better. 
you see, now these I, are the and, things and we need to hear. One hundred percent, and I think that we we don't talk about this enough. Mm. I think it's it's very easy to you know criticize some of the things that have been working, but the reality is that as a country, in many ways, we're not where we need to be, but we're definitely far better off than when we were. You know, than where we were. Um, there are, you know, for example, I mean, if, if I consider just sort of uh, education alone and, and, and tertiary education in particular, I was an outlier at, 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 at UCT. Now people from Kailicha are there and can be counted, right? You know, we need to speak about those things. We need to, we need to speak about the fact that, you know, most of the time when I grew up in Kailicha, we didn't have a, a, a secondary hospital that was well run, um, you know, looking after the population there. And, and yet today we do. We've got schools um, that, are, that, 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 that are functional, um, you know, where people are, are getting the, the, the kind of good education that they need. But we are not where we need to be, I think is the fundamental principle. And I think that we can do more. Right? I think there are lots of people that fall by the wayside. And, and again, this is not to, to not talk about the fact that you know, they, they are plagued with, you know, poverty is still rife. Um, you know, domestic violence is, is, is still commonplace. Um, but that being said, if I was to be honest, um, you know, if, 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 if you had to raise my, my, my dad from the dead and ask him to do his own evaluation of what, what Kailisha looks like today relative to when, you know, he passed in 99, he would see a completely different picture. And I think that should be commended. But I think more can be done. Yeah. I, I, I like to hear that because we, we, it is easy to focus on the negatives. It really, really is. But there are these poles of... of, of positivity that we need yeah. to hang on to because that's why we're here i mean and that's why we keep on doing what we're doing is that we, we we need to make this a better place i mean we are team south africa and i know we're losing so much skills we do that's a fact i mean we're losing the skills but are we gaining skills at the same time and that's what we need to keep on looking at is that people are free to go i mean that's what life is about you move on you find greener pastures if that exists and you try there but you know you also want to know that there are guys coming up the ranks just as you are that are also wanting to better their community that are also wanting to study that are also wanting to go there i mean from from your perspective of gift of the givers i mean you must see lots of young enthusiastic people that are wanting to come there, the youth that are coming to work with you that are traveling with you that are new doctors that are hungry to succeed and make this country a better place do you see that? Can you feel that? People love this country, right? They're just looking for opportunity. Everybody wants an opportunity, and people want to serve. The young generation is coming up. They know the background, the difficulty they've come through, what their parents have been through. You know, and, and from all, all sectors, from the affluent sector and the non-affluent sector, people want to save this country. And they've, they're just looking for an opportunity in which way they can help. And that's why we're having this discussion today. But the private sector now really says, you know what? Let's save this country, let's do something. From, it's no more sticking the register, as I said earlier. The, the, people in the public sector say we're prepared to work. Well, let's take, for example, Easter of Hospital. We did the cataract second procedures last week. Right? And the doctors and anesthetists and all came and they said, look, we'll give our time for free. They're already working overtime, long hours, but they said they'll give our time for free. Some of the nurses couldn't afford it, so we paid for it. You know, we said we'll pay that kind of money. And two weeks ago, we did something unique. It's our first private-public partnership where Midlands Medical Hospital in Peter Marisburg provided all the staff, provided the nurses, provided all the things for you know, translators and, and procedures. All the patients, a whole lot of patients came from Grace Hospital. They gave everything at cost. They paid half, I paid half. But it worked out to about 4,000 for the procedure. It normally costs over 22,000 rand. Yeah. And they said it may be even cheaper than that because the theater time was faster than they expected it. So they said, don't pay now. The price come down, but they pay half. Now, if so many private hospitals in the country just take that one procedure and do it for so many cases in the country, how many poor people get off the grid, mm -hmm. get off the system? We start making, but we make a meaningful difference to the lives of all the ch children. Who are waiting. This child's waiting for three years for a tonsillitis operation. Mm -hmm. The mother said, we're waiting, and every time we, we come, we, we said it, it can't be done. And you see the patients being so distraught. They were actually in shock that it was actually going to be happening today. Till it was done, they still weren't sure it was going to be done. It's an anxiety for the child, for the parents, because they want to get this thing done. We went to Toast Rafi recently. By the way, it's a long story, but we went to Toast Rafi. We heard the people didn't have enough support, you know, didn't have health facilities. We sent a whole team in. We pulled out teeth from 600 people in eight hours. The amazing part was this. It was not medically correct. 
in terms of what is happening. The child is supposed to see outside, so you can't see the other child pulling the teeth out. But there was nowhere else to put them. There were too many. So they were all in the hall. There were 10 chairs, 10 dentists on 10 chairs. The, ch the dentists are there, and the child is here, eight meters apart, watching how the child turns in the chair and jumps and screams as the dentist pulls out four, five, six teeth. The moment it's finished, finish screaming, finish crying, the child from this side walks calmly and goes sit in the chair and is ready to do, go through the same process. And then from outside, they said, we want to watch our friends cry. So when this one went out, they said, now we're going to watch and other friends who laughed at us, we're going to laugh at them now. <laughs> and, but they made it into a joke. But what does it tell you? Mm. It tells you that for months, they've been sitting with a toothache that they don't mind watching the pain that's going through the other child mm. to pull it out. They're going to do the same thing because they, it's easier to do that than to sit with a toothache for so many months. Now, is that allowed? More than 500 people came for glasses, for eye testing. They can't see for three years. Not because there's anything wrong, but they just don't have spectacles so they can see. You've disabled a person for three years simply because he can't get something simple like glasses. How much it cost? 2,000 rand maximum kind of stuff. And you, you economically inactive, can't make progress, self-esteem gone, mental support. All those things happen from a simple intervention. We need to fix those things. And we need the opticians, the, uh, the ophthalmologists. The, we, want, we need the private people, not only as hospitals, but as individual consultants to say, I want to put back. Because I'm privileged. I went through this, this medical institution. I went through this university. I went through this hospital. I benefited. I gained. The government paid half the money for me to go through. We've made, the government has made this contribution because a lot of universities are subsidized. And I benefited. I've got five cars. I've got shares all over the world. I can put something back. Definitely, I can put something back. And that's the kind of mentality we need to put back into our private sector, in the hospitals, individuals, and even businesses, everybody. Let's just fix this country together. You asked one challenge, what can we do now? I'm putting up a challenge right now. We stuck at Charles Makeke again. The first phase, the ambulance emergency phase, was supposed to be ready already and by the end of this month. Yeah. There's a problem now. They're 10 million and short because they suddenly realize it's not their fault, not that people went in. The ventilation system is not working. You can't open a casualty ambulance service if the ventilation system is not working. If they don't find the 10 million rand, all the money they invested in that project comes to waste and they can't get funding from everywhere. So this is an open challenge to all medical aid societies, medical companies, corporates, everybody watching this program, we need 10 million rand yesterday. If you have that, within the next few weeks, the first part, the casualty of Charlotte McKeke can open, and that's the door towards the other parts of the hospital. So mm -hmm. this is an open challenge for everybody who can make it happen. They need 10 million rand to fix that. Brilliant. I know that there, I know the media are tuned in. I know you're watching. I do know you're watching. I'm seeing some of the, 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 the alerts that are going out already. And I know we're interested more in the fifth wave of COVID. And I see that. And there are already articles that are doing the rounds. But this is a story I think media need to, you need to report on. And if we can do that, if this is the start of a public-private partnership and an example that comes out of this summit as a first summit, I think we've done really, really well. Because this is what it's about. It is about the private and the public working together, not against each other, but together. You cannot let Charlotte McTeke go down and all that money that's already invested. People need this hospital. So for me, if we get that out of here, I wish I had 10 million. I could just put it on the table and say, here we go, take it, do it, finish it, make it happen. I wish I could, but I can't. But I know that people are out there that are watching and that can make this happen. So please, let's, let's do this. I want to read a comment. We've got about Oh, seriously? We've got like five minutes? Um, what, two, one minute, 30 left. Okay, now I can't do that. Let me just quickly get into this. I've got five minutes, I think. Um, here's a comment from Clifford Panther saying, changing systems requires political action. There is no way to avoid this. Chatting about systems problems, working around system problems, not forgetting to focus on the good, doing disaster management and relief while helping some people some of the time will not result in long-term system change. Political and economic change, however, is what we need. All right, Clifford, thank you very, very much. Here's another one. Who will train the psychologists? Higher education has no comp capacity to train more students. Um, that's coming in, that's a, an anonymous question. I'm not sure about that, but one thing I do know is the desperation of a lot of students seeking internships, and they, they can't find them. I mean, these are, these, they've gone through the whole system, they've got the qualification, and they can't have an internship. Uh, I mean, even Dr. Mokokong, who was talking to this morning, has to pay half her daughter's 
uh, to go in because because they just can't afford to pay. <laughs> That's another problem. But once again, it's it's about money. Can we find can we find money to be able to solve some of these problems? And yes, we can. People and corporates and private sector will be willing to put their hands up and find the solutions for it. We have. Now, we have a resource constraint. We're not training enough, in fact. Uh, we're not educating enough nurses at a primary care level. We, we have a, an expensive ecosystem in our country. And one of the aspects through home-based care, nurse-based care, virtual consultation services, we're moving towards a, a model of a virtual HMO. And that can make a meaningful impact in the cost of mm. care as well to make it more accessible to, to everybody. Um, so these are not overnight, they a bit more medium term, but we've got to start somewhere, Leanne. All right, let's wrap it up. Let's give everybody a, just I know that I'm going to leave yeah. the final closing word with you, but perhaps maybe let me get the final word from you. I mean, let's, let's leave it to you, um, Dr. Mclomi. Talk to us about um, your vision for the future. Uh, imagine, reimagine healthcare for us. And what are those things that we can start doing to try and improve the healthcare sector in South Africa? Uh, you know, we've had the opportunity, I guess, to, to travel the world and study the best institutions. While presented with many offers, we decided to come back because we really believe in this place. I think many of us, and I, I know I do not speak for myself, that we are committed to making sure that South Africa is not just the best place to live, um, but it, it, it is able to deliver on its promises to many people it has left behind. Um, the vision of the future, I think, for us is a demonstration of our own sort of individual efforts, but also our collective um, efforts in, in, in driving, I guess, a, a more prosperous, a, a more healthy you know, society. And you know, I guess my, my closing, I guess, comment will probably speak to, uh, and I think was probably best summarized by Barry Child's presentation about what can be done practically to address some of the issues within the country. Um, and, and I think that with organizations like Afrocentric, um, working alongside organizations like ourselves and the incredible work that the gift of uh, uh, um, the givers do, I think we definitely have, uh, I think, a, a much, much brighter and more promising society. All right. Uh, Dr. Suleiman? Wrap it up for us on your side. I think I've said enough, but all I'm saying <laughs> is that, that it is brilliant to set up a, a health summit like this. If the country needs it, there's leadership. You know, where we, we're encouraging government and private sector and everybody who can play a role to come together. And the important thing is, we know, we can't turn our back on South Africa. 40 million or even 60 million people need us because all of us are interdependent. And for the benefit of 60 million people, we have to make this work. Yeah. Thank you so much to all of you for being here. I mean, I think it's been um, such a fabulous discussion where we've looked, obviously, at the, the, the very huge difficulties of the health system, but we're also looking at how we fix it, how we build on what we do have, and basically reimagining South Africa's healthcare system because we know what the problems are and we know how to fix them. We need the will to do it. And I think this is a starting point. And let's hope, I really do hope, that if we can, that, that, that whole 10 million for Charlotte Mateke, if it can come from here, then my goodness, we know what we've done. We've done a damn good job today. That much I can say. Um, that'll be really, really great. And I thank you very, very much for watching. But it's not going to be for me to wrap it up. I'm actually going to now hand it over to um, Ahmed to, to close off this engagement for today. So, Ahmed, you take the center stage. <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks, Leanne. And firstly, thank you for facilitating the, the proceedings of today. I, I'm extremely humbled by the greatness of the minds and the people that have been here today that have uh, put their hands up and been willing to participate in all of this. A and I think that what I've seen and listened to through this is, which is incredibly humbling, is the deep sense of optimism of finding the solutions, of helping to solve, helping to move the country forward with some of the challenges that, that we have. And, and that's quite phenomenal. Yes, we know we've got big challenges. We know we have some huge socioeconomic challenges in the country as well. Um, but you cannot have a sick population and think you're going to move forward. We have to start with something. Similarly, you cannot have an uneducated population and think we're going to move forward. So it's easy to see the glass half full, but in fact, there's so much opportunities that we have lying uh, ahead. And we shouldn't let what we've learned over this past two years be wasted. 
So I'd like to see the good work that's been done of public and private that came together. The, once again, the ministers referred to it as well. The president has referred to it. Let's build on that. Let us start cutting out the bureaucracy to the extent that we can and move forward and assist uh, organizations in that regard. I think what's quite important as well for me is that uh, in a day like today, we can only have so many speakers. But that does not stop here. If this work stops today, if we leave this and nothing comes out of it, then we wouldn't have done justice to our jobs of trying to raise our hands. We've got a number of viewers uh, that have dialed in today and so many more people that will be watching this afterwards as well. This is an open invitation to contact us or any of the panelists that was here today to do something. We don't have to be involved in it all. I'm not seeking financial gain out of it all. It's purely about doing something that moves us forward. Let's find a problem, let's tackle a problem, because there are different segments of expertise that, that exist within it. So from my side, Leanne, I'm not going to keep everybody very long, but it's simply to say thank you once again to all our panelists that have joined us today, to all the speakers that have joined us today. It's been absolutely phenomenal conversations, uh, a lot of food for thought, a lot of things that we need to take back, think about, but not think too long, because I think as... Uh, uh, Dr. Imtiaz has referred to, we talk too much, we create too much bureaucracy, too much paperwork. Somebody needs to get on with the job and let's get on with the job at hand. So thank you once again and Leanne, thanks to you as well. Absolute pleasure. Thanks very much for having me. And thanks again to you for tuning in, for watching this, for participating in whichever way you are. And uh, I, 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 I imagine that this is going to be an annual event, I think, bringing together these incredible minds. What a way to kickstart it. And I do hope that we see some real positive changes in the healthcare sector. Have a fantastic day. And once again, thank you very, very much for watching. Bye-bye.